here's a copy of God's Word, and I pray you do. I'd invite you to open up to Galatians 5. And that's on page 975 of your Black Pew Bible. You probably know that page number already because we've been there for quite some time. Uh, also, after you find that, uh, jump over to Mark chapter 10. Uh, that's on page 846 of your Black Pew Bible. And as I say over and over again, if you do not own a Bible, that Black Pew Bible is now your Bible. It's a free gift from Oak Grove. We just ask that you read it and obey it. Now, if you, my, my wife and I are like everybody else. We have bills. We have financial struggles. Uh, one of the things that my wife decided that she wanted to do in order to help us financially a little bit was uh, sell her truck and try to find something a little more uh, economical. And so when I met Tina, she was a Jeep girl. She had this really cool black Jeep, six-inch lift, 35-inch tires. It was neat. It was, it was bad. And, of course, she's five feet tall, so it was, it was kind of funny watching her get in and out of that, kind of like watching her get into my truck now. Um, <laughs> but she decided that she was going to start looking. And sometimes we, we find what we look for because she found a, a 2016 Jeep Wrangler. And it was significantly less than what her trade-in would have been, so we're saving quite a bit of money. I told her, I said, well, listen, baby, I want to make you happy. You want a Jeep? You want to get rid of your truck? I really like your truck, but if you don't want to drive it anymore, get, get whatever makes you happy as long as we can afford it. She said, well, we're not only going to be able to afford it, we're going to be saving about $100 a month. I said, uh, my name is Jimmy. I'll take all you give me. I'm all, I'm all for saving money, right, because none of us are making any extra. And so she gets this Jeep. I said, I have just one condition. Please don't put those stupid ducks in your windshield. Thank you. Yes, somebody agrees with me. And she said, no, I'm not going to do that. But here's what happened. My wife is a researcher. And she researched, what's up with these ducks? And if you're a Jeep owner or an enthusiast, you may have heard the term Jeep ducking. Uh, it's very, very uh, common now. What does it mean, and why exactly do Jeeps get ducked? Now, the practice of Jeep ducking originated in Canada uh, during the pandemic in 2020. A woman from Ontario named Allison Parliament had purchased a whole bunch of rubber ducks before the pandemic, and she decided to give one to a Jeep owner with a note on it that said, have a great day. Now, the intent was to bring a smile to the individual and a little bit of cheer during that, that time of, of pandemic when we were socially uh, isolated and, and we, we couldn't get together, we couldn't talk, especially in Canada, it was even worse than it was in America. Now, this little small interaction turned into much more than expected because the Jeep owner walked out wondering why there was a, a, a rubber duck on his door handle, but when he saw that note, it put a smile on his face. Now, that night, duck, duck, Jeep, was the hashtag trending across Instagram, and the rest is history. So whenever you see a ducked Jeep, you will know what it is. It's a result of a random act of kindness. I know, that's what I said too. <laughs> oh. And then I said, please don't do that. <laughs> and my wife and I are of the age where she said, yeah, I'm with you, baby. So we're in a sermon series called Amazing Grace. We've been in it for quite some time, going through the book of Galatians, uh, what a great book. I have grown. I have learned so much in this book. I hope you have too through this study. But we've been in the fruit of the Spirit for the last four weeks. We looked at joy, love, peace. Last week was my least favorite, which was patience. God's still working on me with that. And today we're going to explore the one fruit of the Spirit that is increasingly rare commodity in our society, which is kindness. Uh, we have become a society where the, the milk of human kindness is souring. Uh, incivility is rising, particularly in our country, particularly in an election year. Imagine that. Uh, and, and an, an alarming amount of American citizens believe that incivility is a serious problem. Now, in December of 2016 poll, 75% of people said that incivility has risen to crisis levels in our country, and 73% of those people said the United States is losing its stature as a civil nation. Now, in a survey done in August of this year, the Society for Human Resource Management said that incivility in the workplace cost our nation $2 billion a day in absenteeism and reduced productivity. Two-thirds of people surveyed revealed that they had experienced or witnessed incivility in their workplace in the past month. 
Uh, 75% said that it has certainly gotten worse in the last 10 years, particularly since that pandemic that we've mentioned. There's actually a nonprofit organization today called the Kindness Society. Here's their mission statement. We're striving to spread kindness by following a simple rule. Do not think, speak, or act unkindly towards others. Everybody can relate with kindness, and everybody can respond to kindness. Mark Twain once said, kindness is a language which the deaf can hear and the blind can read. Now, if we want to look at the definition of kindness, it literally means that which is good, helpful, and suitable. Uh, literally being gracious to one another. In, in other words, responding with the same grace that God has responded to you with. See, kindness really is treating other people the way God has treated you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ forgave you. And so as I was thinking about kindness this week, it, I, I thought about an incident, an incident in the book of Mark uh, where Jesus not only shows us kindness, but he teaches valuable lessons on the kindness that God expects from us. It's a very tender, sweet moment in Scripture, very familiar uh, incident in the life of Jesus, and it dealt with his relationship to little children. Uh, it, we see in this incident literally how kindness walks and how kindness talks. So we're going to be looking at two verses in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. Then we're going to jump to Mark chapter 10 and read a few verses there. And if you're able, I'd invite you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Galatians chapter 5, beginning verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 13. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you for our King Jesus and for the sacrifice that he made for our sins. We thank you for the blood that flowed down Calvary's tree. And for the way that precious cleansing blood washes us white as snow from all of our sin and all of our iniquity and allows us to have a relationship with the true and living God of the universe. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Holy Spirit and for the way that that Spirit continues to grow in us, God, as we yield to the power and the presence of God in our very lives. Father, I pray that you will bless us during this time. I pray that for my brothers and sisters here who are saved, you will continue to cultivate this fruit of the spirit of kindness within their souls, Lord, that we could live our lives in a way that brings honor and glory to you. And it's in Christ's precious holy name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So in this interaction with Jesus and these children, we, we, we see four things that we should focus on if we want to cultivate the fruit of the spirit of kindness in our lives. First, we see how kindness is seen in the Lord. Uh, now, all through the scriptures, we see the kindness of God. God is kind. And if we know God, if we belong to God, we in turn will be kind as well. Thank you. That was one of those amen moments. Amen. We will be kind. And, and I think that when we look at patience, right, I think we all have this, this issue with patience. Nobody likes to wait. When it comes to kindness, I think when that word enters your mind, you, you're thinking of somebody right now. You're thinking, that person is the definition of kindness. And then there may be some people that you're saying, and that person is not. And the Lord really needs to work on them. But remember, the Lord needs to work on all of us. He is at work constantly. This, this road of sanctification is for all of us. And we're all growing, and we all grow at, at different stages, and we all grow at different speeds. But we are all still growing in the Lord. Verse 13 said, They were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. 
Uh, now, now, one might think that the Lord who walked on water, healed the sick, raised the dead, fed multitudes, would have had no time for children or babies. Uh, that was completely wrong. Jesus had time for everybody. Jesus stopped what he was doing to minister to the least of these. Now, we had a child dedication about a month or so ago. Time, time eludes me sometimes. I don't know if it was a month, two weeks, six weeks. But we recently, I like to use that word, we recently this year had a child dedication. And that's kind of the same thing. These people would bring their children to Jesus. Back in those days, they would bring a child to a rabbi to bless them. They could see the love in Jesus, and they wanted their children to come to him and for him to bless them. And the disciples are saying, Jesus is too important for you. Jesus doesn't have time for you. And the scriptures say that Jesus was indignant. Now, that word means he was burning with anger. Well, what did they do that was so bad? He was hindering the children from coming to him. Friends, don't ever hinder anybody from coming to Jesus. Absolutely don't. One of the worst things that we can think or do is look at somebody and say, you know what, that person's so rotten, there's no way they would ever come to Christ. You are hindering them from coming to Christ. We should share Jesus with everybody because that's what Christ did. He had time for everyone. And you see, the disciples are telling these people, bringing their children to Jesus, Jesus don't have time to waste. Jesus got all the time in the world. Jesus created time. Time to Jesus is linear because he sees the end from the beginning. And he has time for everyone. Verse 14, but when Jesus saw it, he became indignant and said to them, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Now, you're never going to find anywhere in scripture that somebody came to Jesus with a need that he did not respond to it in some way. Jesus always had the time whether it was friend or foe, to speak a good word and do a kind deed. Now, the Lord Jesus came into an unkind world. Amen? I have conversations with folk all, folks all the time, and it breaks my heart because the, these conversations will turn to, well, I used to go to church, but the church hurt me. Well, look what the church did to Jesus. And that's what I tell these folks. I'm sorry that someone other than Jesus was unkind to you. But you cannot abandon Jesus Christ because one of his followers wasn't acting like Christ. That doesn't really make any sense. It's sometimes just an excuse to walk away and to, to try to find the greener pasture somewhere else. So, listen, we've all been hurt by church people. Uh, everybody's shaking your head. <laughs> If you've been in church for any amount of time, you've been hurt by church folks. You know why? Because we're humans. We're humans. And, and we're all on the road of sanctification at different speeds. Some people get there faster than other people. And some people still act like the world a little bit, even though they're in the church. But we're, we're in the world. We're not of the world. But we're still in the world. And sometimes the, the world rubs off on us. And Jesus doesn't rub on us Enough. So if the church hurts you, uh, as, a, as a representative of Oak Grove, I'm sorry that occurred. But Jesus didn't do it. So come to Christ and let Christ heal your heart. Because only Jesus can. There's going to be mean people no matter where you go. And Jesus came into an unkind world. There was no hospitals. There was no institutions or organizations of mercy. There was no orphanages, no mental institutions. And yet when Jesus came, he poured out kindness to every instance of human suffering. Remember, Jesus is God in the flesh, and God is kind. Psalm 117, verse 1. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. One of the hardest verses in Scripture that I think many of us have trouble following is when the scripture tells us that we are to love our enemies. Amen. Somebody said it that time. Do you know why we are told to love our enemies? Well, let me tell you. Actually, let Jesus tell you. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. But love your enemies and do good. And lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. 
See, God is not only kind to those who are evil and don't deserve his kindness, and guess what? That's all of us. We have, to, we, have to, we have to recognize that. None of us deserve his grace. We are all enemies of God before we come to God. All right? God is kind and gracious and, and loving to those who are evil. But he's also kind and gracious and loving to those who are unthankful and are ungrateful. Now, that should tell you something about kindness. Kindness costs, but it cannot be bought. Now, on, uh, in a night, August 1997, the night that Princess Diana was killed in a car accident, uh, another lady died, and, and there wasn't a whole lot of talk about it, Mother Teresa. Now, now, whatever you think of this woman, she was one of the kindest people that ever lived. I don't, I don't care for her theology, but I like her practice because she was ha the hands and feet of the Lord. Now, she did many acts of kindness, but one sticks out in particular. She was working in the slums of Calcutta, dressing the wounds of a leper. An American tourist observed her and asked if he could take a picture. Now, she gave his permission, and the guy framed his shot. Now, through the camera lens, he could see this world-renowned nun uh, gently, gently placing a bloody bandage over a, a leper's uh, a gaping hole in his face where his nose used to be. The photographer could smell the stench as he got in for a closer shot. And after capturing several images, the tourist said to her sister, I wouldn't do what you're doing for $10 million. Mother Teresa looked at him and said, my friend, neither would I. Because kindness costs, but it can't be bought. See, God is kind both to the sinner and he's kind to the saint. Because think about this, it is the kindness of God that supplies our salvation. It is the kindness of God that sent his son to die for my sins. Amen. God's mercy and grace. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. But when goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. God's kindness leads me away from sin, and it leads me to salvation. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? That's why God is kind to us. God wills for no one to perish, but that all to come to him in saving faith that he might save your soul. God's kindness reserves a home in heaven for us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Now see, the matter of fact is, if you are truly saved, you cannot help but be kind because God himself is kind and God's kindness lives in your heart. I, I, I said at the beginning of this section of this, this sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit that we possess all of them. We possess all of them. And sometimes we, we fight, we resist against the Spirit. I don't want to be kind to that person. That person said something to me that, that hurt me. Look to Jesus and look to what he did. Kindness is shown in our Lord. Second, kindness is to be shown in our lives. Now, children were looked down upon in those days. Uh, they were considered the least and the littlest. And, and Jesus treated each one of those kids Special because in his eyes, kids are special. Amen. Kids are special to Jesus. Do you realize that the first human that ever really responded to Jesus was an unborn baby? Think about that. John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb. The name of Jesus was spoken. Amazing. And Jesus knit and knits these children in their mother's womb. Every life is valuable. Now, when we read this, when Luke tells us about this, not only were little kids brought in, but infants and babies were brought to Jesus. And I think it's important because we should handle people's feelings and emotions and their lives like we would a little teeny tiny baby with, with, with tender gentleness, with love and with kindness. And one of the greatest... Uh, lessons that I've learned about leadership is that tenderness can motivate people to do things that toughness cannot. There's an Aesop's fable that I heard many, many years ago. The sun and the wind were arguing over who was the strongest. 
And the wind said, you see that old man down there? I can make him take off his coat quicker than you can. So the sun agreed, and he went behind a cloud, and the wind blew up a storm. However, the harder the wind blew, the tighter the old man held on to his coat and put it around him. Now, eventually the wind gave up, and the sun came out. The sun began to smile warmly on the old man, and before long, the old man was mopping the sweat off his brow. He pulled off his coat and strolled on his way. The sun knew the secret. Warmth, friendliness, and a gentle touch are always stronger than force and fury. And I believe that one of the greatest marks of a leader is kindness. Ronald Reagan was one of my favorite presidents. I, I, I remember living in, in America during that time, and I felt safe in this country. Uh, I felt safe, first of all, because I'd given my heart to Jesus in that decade. And second of all, we had competent leadership in our White House. Uh, but I heard a story about Reagan that touched my heart. He was the governor of California, and he was running for the presidential nominee in 1976. He lost to Jerry Ford. And he was getting ready for a rally in a North Carolina parking lot, and a lady came over to one of his aides and said, I've got a group of blind children, and since they can't see him, I was wondering if you could have Governor Reagan come over and say hello to them. Now, Reagan's chief of staff, Michael Deaver, went over to Reagan and gave him the request. Reagan said absolutely he would do it, but he had one stipulation. He didn't want any photographers around. Now, during a presidential race, the reporters would have would have been in a frenzy to take this wonderful shot of Reagan with these little blind children, and he said no. So he waited around until all the photographers left, and he walked behind the platform where he met these children. Uh, he didn't just walk over and speak to them and leave. He actually sat down in the parking lot and began to talk to them. He let them ask him questions, and after they had asked him a couple questions, he said, now I have a question for you. Would you like to touch my face so you can get a better understanding of how I look. Now the children squealed with excitement. They, they were so excited for this. And, and Reagan sat there one by one as these children, their little dirty fingers, rubbed all over his face to see what he looked like. And years later, this is what Michael Deaver said, the only picture of that scene is the picture in my mind. But I can still see those little kids touching Ronald Reagan's face and smiling those really big smiles and thinking, what a kind man he is. Kindness is one of the greatest traits of a good leader. It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. And I want to encourage every one of you to take every opportunity you can to be kind to people because you reflect positively upon your Savior, Jesus Christ, when you do that. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, you, can, you cannot do a kindness too soon for you never know how soon it will be too late. As I said before, women and children were seen as commodities, certainly not people that would have commanded the attention of someone of Jesus' stature. And yet, all throughout Scripture, what do we see? We see Jesus responding to the least of these, to the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, uh, the, the 12-year-old girl uh, that Jesus uh, goes to Jairus' house and raises her from the dead. He took time for the marginalized. He took time for the ones that were ignored. Jesus exhibited kindness in his life, and that kindness should be shown in our lives. Third, we see how kindness is to be shared with our lips. Now, notice carefully what the Lord Jesus did with these little children. He didn't just take them up and give them a quick kiss and send them on the way. Verse 16 said, and he took them in his arms, and he blessed them, laying his hands upon them. Every single one of us has a kindness kit that we carry everywhere we go. It's in our mouths, and we call it a tongue. Never underestimate the power of a kind word. There's an old Japanese proverb that says, one kind word, word can warm three winter months. And remember this, kindness is not only the way that we are supposed to act, it's also the kind of way that we're supposed to react. The way that we're supposed to react, because we can set ourselves up to act a certain way. But when something happens, our quick reaction to it, that's got to come out of who your character is. How you respond to, to negative comments. How you respond to someone being rude to you. That shows a lot about your character. Uh, because a dead fish floats downstream. <laughs> it, when, when you have the cultivation of the fruit of the spirit of kindness in your heart, you respond kindly. It's one thing to respond kindly to a friend. It's a different thing to respond kindly to an enemy. 
It's one thing to respond to people who like you. It's another to respond in kind to people who don't. It's one thing to be kind to people who benefit us. It's another to be kind to people who are of no benefit to us. One of the greatest golfers of all time was an Argentinian player named Roberto Di Vincenzo. He, he won a tournament one time, and after winning the, the, the check, he was, he was walking to his car. He'd left the locker room, and as he was walking, he was approached by a young woman. She congratulated him on the victory and told him that her child was seriously ill and he was near death. She didn't know how she was going to pay the doctor's bill. She didn't know how she was going to pay the hospital expenses. He was so touched by her story, he took out a pen, and he endorsed the winning check and stuck it in her hand. He said, make some good days for the baby. Now, the very next week, he was at a country club having lunch, and a PGA official came over to his table. He said, some of the boys told me you met a young woman in the parking lot last week after you won that tournament. And DiVincenzo nodded that he did. He said, well, I have some bad news for you. She's a phony. She has no sick baby. She fleeced you out of that money, my friend. And DiVincenzo looked at him and said, you mean there's no sick baby dying? And the guy said, that's right. He said, that's the best news I've heard all week. Now, I don't know what Roberto DiVincenzo's theology was. I don't know if he was a Christian, but I can tell you this. His actions and attitudes and words at that moment reflected a Christ-likeness. That's what we should all strive to do. We should be concerned about the welfare of everybody that we come in contact with and do everything we can to help them. Jeremiah 9.24 says, I am the Lord who practices kindness justice and righteousness in the earth for in these things i delight says the lord so let's be like jesus let's be kind not only with the deeds that we do but with the words that we say and i think it's i think you, we need to remember one thing this is not just pie in the sky uh, kindness is not softness it, it's not a sentimental indulgence that tolerates wrong and evil in other people if I went to the doctor and the doctor discovers that I had a tumor and he says, well, you know, I don't want to cause this man any emotional pain. I don't want to upset him in any way. I don't want him to leave here discouraged or upset. And he comes back into the office and says, listen, everything looks great. Don't worry. Be happy. Go on home. Is he being kind to me? No, he's being just the opposite. He's being unkind. Now, that doctor, if he's going to be kind, he's going to come in and say, Mr. Testerman, you've got a brain tumor. We have got to immediately give you surgery, and we've got to remove that tumor. You're probably going to have to have radiation, chemotherapy. That would be the kind thing, that you point out the thing that is killing you. Friends, sin is killing all of us. That is, that is the, the worst contagion in the universe, is sin. And we should be confronting the sin of others and condemning the sin in in others, but when we do that, we must do it in kindness. Galatians 6.1 Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest too you be tempted. So there is a way to point out others' faults without being harsh and mean. You can make a critical point with a kind comment. A calm demeanor goes a lot farther than a harsh comment and an ugly tone of voice. And that's where the statement, bless your heart, comes from. In case y'all didn't know that. I guess I gave my jig up here. If, if I look at you and say, well, bless your heart. Now, if I say, bless your pea-picking heart, uh, <laughs> you might want to delve into what that means. But we can, we can be critical with people. But we can do it in a kind way. My, my friend Mike Watts, years ago, he owns, he owns a construction company in town. He, he would, whenever he had criticism to give somebody, he would call it the criticism sandwich. He would say something nice, then he would punch you in the throat, and then he would say something nice and pray with you. And, and, and so what you remember is, yeah, Mike pointed something out, but he was really nice and gracious and kind in the way he did it. And that it really is, friends, how we should, how we should operate. I heard about a man who was standing in line to buy an airline ticket. He got up to the counter. He said, I'd like to buy a ticket to New York City. The woman said, no problem. Do you have any luggage with you? He said, yes, I have three bags. And she said, okay, we're going to send them all to New York. He said, no, I want the first one sent to Phoenix. I want the second one sent to Seattle. I want the third one sent to London. She said, sir, we can't do that. He said, you did it last week. 
Always respond and react with kindness. Kindness should be shared with our lips. Finally, how kindness should be sown by our love. Now, it's no coincidence that we read that Jesus took them up in his arms and laid his hands on them. And I can tell you, when those children felt the touch of that master's hand, they felt a gentle current of kindness that would have flowed through his touch. We've all heard that song, Jesus Loves the Little Children. And what we're seeing in this passage is actually love in action, which is one of the best definitions of what kindness is. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, the Apostle Paul says, Love is kind. Now see, sometimes love is heard in a kind word or a kind note or a kind touch. Stephen Shogren said, God is looking for people who are willing to participate in acts of love and kindness to those outside of their present circle. He is looking for people who believe that humble demonstration of love plants a seed of eternity in the hearts of others that will blossom into faith in Christ. And throughout the New Testament, Jesus shows us love in action. In the book of Matthew, we see one of the most amazing interactions of all time. Matthew 8, chapter, two, or chapter 8, verse 2. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, can you make me clean? And verse 3 tells us this, And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. And he said, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. Now that's an amazing, amazing scripture. That's the first instance in the entire Bible that anybody ever touched a leper. And it was without question a touch of kindness. Dr. Paul Brand is a leprosy specialist. He was. He's, he's in heaven now. Leprosy is a terrible disease, except for the very early stages. Patients cannot feel any physical pain. In fact, that's the problem that leads to many of their deaths. Uh, the, the leprosy bacilli, it deadens nerve cells, so patients can no longer feel pain. Then they can damage their bodies without knowing it. They can walk on sharp objects. They, they can take a, a splintered hammer and, and, and hammer with it all day. They can, they can put their hand on a hot stove and not know that they're being burned. And this can lead to infections, loss of limb. It can lead to death. But at no time does the patient actually feel any physical pain. They may not hurt, but they do suffer. Because while they don't feel physical pain, they feel personal and social pain. They're ostracized. They, they are, are rejected by the community. They're outcast. Now, Dr. Brand told one of these bright young men he was treating in India, and during the course of the examination, Dr. Brand simply laid his hand on the patient's shoulder and told him through a translator the kind of treatment he was going to give him. Now, to his surprise, the man began to shake with muffled sobs, and Dr. Brand asked his translator, did I say something wrong to this man? And the translator asked the patient why he was crying to turn translator turned to Dr. Brand and said this, no doctor, he said he is crying because you put your hand on his shoulder. You are the first person who has touched him in all the years he has been a leper. Friends, listen, in kindness, God reached down and touched me as a 13-year-old boy when I was covered with the leprosy of sin. Jesus swept me up in his arms. He laid his hands on me. He blessed me with forgiveness and salvation. And listen, if he hasn't already done that in your life, he wants to. He bids you to come to him, that he may lay his loving, kind hands upon you and bless you and change your life forever. Jesus stands at the, at the door of your heart, and he knocks. In kindness, Jesus came. In kindness, Jesus lived. In kindness, Jesus loved. In kindness, Jesus died. And in kindness, God raised him from the dead. In kindness, he offers you the same mercy, grace, forgiveness, and salvation today. But friends, Jesus is a gentleman. He knocks at your heart's door. He will not kick it in and take you by force. He will only take you by choice. Your choice to repent and receive Jesus Christ. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Romans 10 says, If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved in the name of of the living God, Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Receive the Spirit and begin cultivating the fruit of the Spirit 
in your life. And you can be, begin cultivating kindness in your life today. We can only do this because of the kindness and grace of Jesus Christ. It's in that spirit and in that name. When we meet fellow saints and fallen sinners on the highway of life, he gives us the power to always be kind. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you and thank you for the love that you've demonstrated for us, the kindness that you have shown to us, God, that has led to our repentance and salvation. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today who are struggling with this fruit of the Spirit. God, it's in them. They're just not cultivating it at times. So help us all, God, to be more kind. Example, that God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, you took the initiative. You didn't wait for us to come to you and, and ask for forgiveness. You died in advance with the hope that we would come to you. So, Father, speak to the sinner today. Speak to their heart. God, they're covered with the leprosy of sin. And they need to be washed clean, and only your precious blood can do that. Lord, we all need to grow in, our, in the spirit that lives within us. And so from our brothers and sisters here today who have repented and have trusted in Jesus, I pray that you would grow that spirit of kindness in their hearts and in this church family. God, that when we would leave here, we would boldly proclaim the name of Christ everywhere we go because that is the kindest thing that we can do. Help us, Lord, to grow your kingdom. We give you all honor, and we give you all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. If the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you, and you'd like to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, the Bible says he is faithful and true. He will do that right here and right now. Salvation and eternity starts at the cross. Bring your sin to Jesus. Turn from that sin and turn to the Savior. Repent and ask Jesus to cleanse you, and he will do that. Our staff's going to be down front during this time of invitation. We would love to receive you. We'd love to pray with you and help get you started on this road of redemption, this, this road of sanctification. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you'd like to join our church, or maybe you just need someone to pray with. Whatever your need, please come as the Spirit moves you.